We're going to talk about the difference between a one-sided or two-sided alternative or a one versus two-sided hypothesis test. So previously we worked through an example where we said suppose we know that the mean BMI in the US in 2008 was 25.3 and we want to check if it has increased by 2018. So we take a sample of 25 individuals from the population. We found a sample mean of 27.8 and a sample standard deviation of 6. So we start with a null hypothesis that the mean in 2018 hasn't changed. That's 25.3. And our test statistic came out to be 2.08. So first, let's look at the idea of a one-sided alternative. Okay. Here, we're looking at an alternative hypothesis that the mean in 2018 is now greater than the mean of, of 2008. Okay. Versus the idea of a two-sided test, a two-sided alternative, where there, we're looking at an alternative that the mean for 2018 is not equal to 25.3. So we're going to talk our way through the difference um, between each of these. In the one-sided test, we're looking at um, a deviation on one direction, um, or one side of the null hypothesized value. So here, we essentially want to ask the question, right, we saw that the estimate we got was 2.08 standard errors above what we hypothesized it should have been if the null was true. So here we're looking at what's the probability of getting an estimate 2.08 or more above the hypothesized value of 25.3. So if we draw that out here, and this is if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of getting an estimate of 27.8 or more, or an estimate that's 2.08 or more standard errors above the hypothesized value? Okay. And if you work this out then using Z, it comes out to be 1.9%. And we saw, just for the sake of completeness or correctness, if you use the T distribution, which is technically the right way to go, the p-value is going to come out to be 2.4%. Okay, so again, this tells us if our null hypothesis is true, if the mean hasn't changed, the probability of getting an estimate 2.08 standard errors um, above okay, or more is about 1.9%. Thinking about a two-sided test, here we're asking the question, What's the probability of getting an estimate, right, the sample mean, that's 2.08 or more standard errors away from the hypothesized value? Okay, so drawing that out in a picture. What's the probability of getting an estimate 2.08 standard errors or more above? or 2.08 standard errors or more below the mean. Okay, now, in some sense, the two-sided test, you can think of, or I think of it, as asking a bit more of a fairer question. Um, rather than looking at how often we get an estimate that's about two standard errors above what we hypothesized, how often will we see a deviation this large? How, how often will our estimate move to 2.08 or more standard errors away from what we hypothesized? How often will we see an absolute deviation this large? One thing you can notice is that the two-sided alternative, okay, here's the two-sided p-value, is just going to be double the one-sided p-value. So again, if you use the technically correct way of using the t-distribution, you're going to get a p-value of 4.8%. Okay, so um, a few things to, to note about this. Um, so I guess the first is that 
In essence, the two-sided alternative or the two-sided test just gets you double the p-value of the one-sided test. Um, okay. But I like to think that in some sense it's a fairer question to ask or a little bit more conservative. Um, you can notice that in a practical sense it's not a big difference. If the p-value is small, it's going to be small regardless of a one- or two-sided test. If it's large, it's going to be large regardless of a one- or two-sided test. Um, now, one important thing to note, you might be thinking, what if we had the case where um, our one-sided test, say, had a p-value come out to be 3%, then in the two-sided test, it's going to become 6%, right? And that's going to cross that magical threshold of alpha of 5%. Okay. But what's important, I can't stress this enough, is we don't want to get stuck on this alpha being 5% as a magical cutoff, okay? Um, I would consider the 3% and 6% p-values of, of roughly the same. Okay. While p-values are helpful, we can't take a research question and boil it down to one single number that tells us is something happening or not. If we want to study is some exposure to some risk factor harmful, is some treatment beneficial, things like these, we don't want that entire decision to depend on one number, a okay, p-value that we calculate. Okay, so again, Read through the American Statistical Association statement on p-values. It's going to give a, a much deeper discussion. In class, we'll um, read it and talk about it a little bit. Um, but when trying to answer a research question, say, for the sake of discussion, let's say, is some exposure harmful to you? Right? We can do some hypothesis tests and calculate a p-value. We can also look at the actual effect size. Right? And that's captured in this here, in this particular test, okay, or how large is the effect. Building a confidence interval around that effect size right, can tell us a range of plausible values for the effect size. Um, thinking about the context, um, what was the sample size? Right? Do we have a too wide of a margin of error? Um, we'll talk about power shortly. Is our power too low? Um, what was the study design? How was the data collected? These things all affect the generalizability or the limitations of our study. So all of these things as a whole should be used to make your decision. Right? Our decision on is some exposure harmful to you shouldn't depend on one single number that you calculate a p-value. And our decision to say exposure to some risk factor is harmful or not harmful depend on did we do a one-sided or two-sided test. Okay, so remember, the p-value is one tool that's useful in making a decision. It's not a number that can tell us everything. Hope you guys liked the video. Stick around, guys, because we got lots more. Statistics is so much fun.